Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for the joy of serving you. And thank you for your love in every heart. We're asking tonight, Lord, that you move us forward again in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see the eyes of our mind, the eyes of our spirit, that we'll see correctly and then our feet spiritually will walk in the path of duty in Jesus' name. Your people will not be tired. We will not be weary. There will be no fainting in any heart. But you will do exploits for the glory of the Lord in Jesus' name. Bring success to everyone. We pray for a youth uh, program coming up. We pray, Lord, you are going to open the windows of heaven upon our youth. That all over this state, you will touch lives of young people in Jesus' name. Lift them up. Raise them for discouragement, your boldness and courage in Jesus' name. Our youths will do well. They will succeed. And those of us who are leading them will have joy over our youth in Jesus' name. Bless us tonight. And use us to bless other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Better, amen. God has blessed you already. Please sit down. We're coming to John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep, and flees, and the wolf catches them, and scatters them. The hireling flees, because it's an hireling, and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Therefore does my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. The passage we have read tells us about Christ. Christ introducing himself, Christ describing himself, and Christ demonstrating and showing himself as the shepherd, the good shepherd. And he says that the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. And he does that because of his love. And he said this is completely voluntary. He wasn't being forced into doing it. He wasn't being pushed into doing it. He wasn't being compelled into doing it. He said, I lay down my life myself. Nobody takes it away from me. He says everything I lay down, my life, my skill, my glory, Everything I have that I lay down for the sheep, I do that voluntarily. And this is why my father loves me, because he sees my love for the sheep. And as the Lord has raised us up as workers, house fellowship leaders, local church pastors, and district pastors, and group pastors, 
He's called us to be shepherds alongside with him. And he wants us to show that same love. The love that gives, the love that shows the way, and the love that voluntarily does everything we are called to do. Not that we are forced, not that we are compelled, not that something or somebody is pushing us. It's not because we are afraid of punishment, or we are afraid of rebuke, or afraid of discipline, afraid of anything. We just love the sheep. And because we love the sheep, that's why we give what we give. And not only that we give what is necessary, we go the extra mile to do even what has not been outlined we should do. It's just like a mother taking care of a baby. You could outline and say, uh, you know, the mother should do this and do this and do this. You will always miss something out. And then there is a need in that child. There's a need that child demonstrates. And the mother is not going over the checklist whether this one is part of what I should do. She just gives herself naturally, spontaneously because of the love. And that's what Jesus Christ is saying. The kind of love we ought to have and the kind of love he himself has demonstrated is a kind of love that doesn't have any boundary. It doesn't have any territory. It doesn't have any limitation. It doesn't have any kind of a limitation to spell it out for me so that I will know my job description. If I know my job description, I do this final and that is it. Give me the closing hour. And this is the hour. Once that hour clocks, I'm out. I'm eager to come out of this place. I'm eager to finish what I'm doing. And once I finish, I'm, I'm off. That's not the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated. He demonstrated perfect love. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the shepherd's perfect love for the sheep. The shepherd's Perfect love for the sheep. It tells us in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 13. John chapter 15. Reading from verse 13. It says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his very life. You know what's contained in that? This is a man that is uh, grown up, a man that has a desire to live, a man that knows how precious life is, a man that knows the goal of living and the joy of living and the excitement of living, a man that has a lot of things he has said, when I grow up, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then all of a sudden, there is a need now that he lays down his life for his friend. And he says, I forget all my dream, I forget all my goal, I forget my aspiration, I forget my ambition. Because of my friend, I lay down my very life. I lay down my very ambition. I lay down my very aspiration. I lay down all the dreams I've thought about. You know, that's the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated. And he laid down his glory in heaven. He laid down the worship of angels. He laid down all the respect he had in, the, in eternity. Before even the world was created. He laid down everything. And he, he came over here. He suffered for us. And he said, search in the Bible. Search in history. Search anywhere since humanity began. No man has had a love as great as this that he laid down his life for the brethren. And you know, it's not just laying down the life. If you look at Jesus Christ, it's not like, um, okay, there is a guillotine uh, that is going to cut up the head suddenly. And then you don't even feel any pain. The head is there and then they just uh, put it and, suddenly, and then it's gone. It's not like that. There was betrayal. He knew it was coming, and he said, I'll go through that. 
and there was uh, you know the slapping on the face and the speeching on his face he said i know it's coming i'll go through that why because of the law you see the work we're called to and the shepherding the uh, the work of the leader the work of the minister there are people that think that there'll be no sun in their way there'll be no challenge in the ministry there'll be no kind of inconvenience at all and you say yes i'm going to serve the lord isn't it good serving the lord when everybody is saying yes uh, yes uh, yes sister we appreciate you we love you there's going to be a challenge or difficulty and jesus christ knew all that and he said there is no greater love than this that even though i know that the betrayal is coming i know the suffering is coming i know that uh, you know the the crucifixion will come and eventually they examined him and he could see all the loopholes in all the examination because uh, he said Pilate said i find no fault in this man and yet he scorched him that's, that's unfair. That's unfair. Why are you scourging him? You find no fault in this man. You find no fault in this man. You allow the soldiers to put a crown of thorns upon his head. That's unfair. And Jesus knew it was not fair. And yet he said, Yes, I'm going through it. And I'm going through it without any complaint. I'm going through it without any murmuring at all. And when, uh, you know, Pilate said, Are you not answering me? Don't you know I have the power? to crucify you I have the power to release you he said you think so you would have had no power over me if I didn't surrender myself unto you even the people that delivered me to your hand that have greater fault and greater sin they couldn't do anything I could have called the angels from heaven to scatter all of them but greater love as no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And as we follow the Lord as shepherds, as we follow the Lord as workers, as we follow the Lord as people that stand in for him and represent him, it is that kind of love that even though the heat may be on, even though the difficulties may be on, even though the challenges may be on, it's not that you don't have to be strong. You know, somebody says if you are going to endure all that, you have to be very strong. Not at all. Look at a mother. A mother that, you know, sometimes a mother is even a teenager. And she doesn't have all the lessons and all the teaching and all the antenatal, you know, lectures that, uh, you know, when the child wakes up at night at uh, 1.30 a.m., this is, you have to wake up and then you have to do this, you have to do that. This is a teenager, this is a girl that enjoys sleep. And before that child came, you know, that the teenager will just sleep and even over sleep, you'll be waking her up and it's okay. Is it seven o'clock yet uh, already? And then, you know, she now has a baby as a child. And, you know, all the inconveniences, everything, because of the love. That's my baby. That's my child. And because that's my child, it doesn't matter at all changing diapers and, you know, cleaning up this and cleaning up that. A girl that, did, you know, couldn't even wash her own clothes before. But now everything has changed. You know what? Because of love. And when we have love, like the shepherd has love for the sheep. It says, greater love as no man than this the challenges of ministry you face without complaint and the pressure of ministry you face without crying because you love the people you love the people you know sometimes you are in a taxi sometimes you are in a in a bus and uh, you know somebody a mother has a baby and the baby for whatever reason the baby is crying and crying and crying and because that's not your baby that's not your child you're feeling it inside you you're looking back and say why I, you know why this mother like that and then the mother will, will forget about all the crowds there all the people there and then will be tossing the baby up and then will be singing to a baby and while the mother is singing the mother the child is still crying and crying and you will if you were already you have even been embarrassed because you know the child is crying disturbing everybody but that mother doesn't think about anything anybody there you know why there is love and the same thing as we're serving the Lord. This is the love that the Lord is expecting. That you will serve the Lord. Thank God you are serving the Lord. You'll serve him better. I will serve him better. 
no complaint. I said no complaint, no murmuring, no embarrassment, no shyness. And if any of my children, if any of my babies, any of those in the house fellowship, any of those members, if they're crying and crying and crying, they come to knock at your door. And then the neighbors are saying, well, you, these people, you, you, this is your church people, they have come again, they have come again. But you will not be embarrassed in Jesus' name. And then you welcome them because here is a worker that is dotting upon the people. Here is a worker that loves the people. Here is a worker that is given and yielded to the care of the people because greater love, greater love as no man than this that a man should lay down his life for his brethren. Look at what follows there. It says in verse 14, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I call you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Think about that. All things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. That is love. You see, a shepherd over the sheep, loving the sheep, he keeps no secret. You know, there are some people, they're too secretive. There are some people, they are men and women of themselves. They are detached from the sheep they are leading. They are detached from the members they are leading. He's too young to know anything about me. And he's too far away from me. We're not of the same, at the same level. I am at this level, and she is of that level. They cannot give the example of their own lives to those people. They can open Bible, they can read scriptures, they can, and their life, what that person is going through, is very similar to what he has gone through and to what she has gone through. But no, you know, you, as, uh, I still need to keep my self-respect and I still need to keep all the information about myself you know they're not even showing the love they will show to their own biological child to their own biological daughter to their own biological son if it were their biological child they'll say my boy come on here you know when I was younger this happened to me this happened to me and what you are going through now I went through that and the child will receive encouragement but because, you know, these leaders, they're too much of self-respect. They're in the ivory tower. And the love they show is a theoretical love. I pray your love will not be theoretical. We're coming to uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 13 verse 1. It tells us here, it says now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world, hold on there, hold on there, he should depart out of this world, and you know he was not, uh, you know, going like uh, somebody slept, and then he died, passed on, without any pain. We saw him yesterday, and he was hale and hearty. And he didn't have any pain at all. And then some people say, let me die like that so that, you know, I just sleep, uh, sleep and then I'm gone. The way, way Jesus went, you know, trial, trouble, agony, Gethsemane, crying, shedding of blood, that he is his own, uh, his own uh, kind of sweat, like great drops of blood. That's how he went. And then being nailed on the cross. And then being kind of reproached, come down. And then will believe you. He knew that all that was going on. But look at what follows now. He was going to the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world. Tell me what you read there. He loved them unto them. Thank God you are here today. There are some workers, if they have a little problem, a little heartache, a little challenge, a little kind of inconvenience in their place of work, they are going to come to the workers' training. If they have a little kind of hindrance, 
they're not going to go to the house fellowship. If they have a little kind of uh, maybe oppression or maybe it's uh, their landlord that is making trouble with them, if, or maybe it's the husband that misunderstands them, or maybe it's the wife that's misunderstanding the husband, if they have a little challenge, they're not going to do their duty. But Jesus Christ, the shepherd's perfect love for the sheep, he said, problem, I knew it will come. Challenge, I knew that will come. Oppression, I knew that will come. And then the agony and the suffering, I knew that will come. And the betrayal of even one of my disciples, I knew that will come. And yet, having loved his own, he loved them unto the very end. I pray that will be spoken about you. Look at John chapter 13, reading from verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. There's no doubt in your mind that the love of Jesus was a perfect love. Perfect love. Perfect love. And yet he said, I'm giving you this new commandment now. You've been with me. You've observed me. You've watched me. And you've seen the kind of love I manifested towards your perfect love. And this is the new commandment I'm giving to you that she love one another as I have loved you that she also love one another. It will be done. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It's by this love, perfect love, Christ-like love, progressive love, practical love, purifying love. It's by this love that helps other people, lifts up other people, and does like Jesus, what Jesus would have done if Jesus were here. Is this kind of love. A self-forgetting love. You forget yourself. And you forget your challenges. And you forget your difficulties. And you forget the pressure that you are facing in your place of work or in your community. You forget everything and then you are cheerful. You know, you will not see it on the face of Jesus Christ. When they even look at this, when he was already betrayed and the people fell on the ground, he said, but I said, who are you looking for? And he said, they said, Jesus said, but I told you already that I'm him. And if you're looking for me, let this go. He was even still thinking about the protection, about the security and the safety of his disciples when he was already being betrayed and being arrested. And then somebody threw out the sword and then cut off somebody's ear. Who was that person? And then he bent down. Look at that. The love that he had, that even though he knew this is going to be the beginning of a very serious issue, very serious problem, he bent down and put the ear back there to work a miracle even for his enemies. And then he told uh, Peter, he said, put your sword back. Because if anybody carries the sword, I don't want this to happen to you, so don't use the sword like that. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, I've told you that you'll fight. But because my kingdom is not of this world, that's why we're not employing carnal methods. He still loved, even in that situation, the Lord is saying, you can do it, you can do it. Because he says, this is exactly why I called you, and I'm showing you an example that he should follow what I have done. When it comes to your turn, you will do it. Look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21, and I'm reading here from verse 15. John chapter 21, reading from verse 15. In verse 15, it tells us, here is the Lord Jesus Christ asking Peter. He said, so when they are dying, Jesus says unto Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Well, you don't have a right to ask a question that, you know, do you love me more than this? If you yourself, if you have not demonstrated that love more than these, because Jesus Christ, he loved us and he loved the sinners and he loved the people he came to save more than his glories in heaven. 
He loved us more than the angels in heaven. He loved us more than all the, all the splendor and the goodness of paradise and he of heaven. He loved us more than all the worship of the angels in heaven. And because he loves us more than them all, he had the right and he could say, Simon. Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Look at this in verse 15. He says unto him, Yea, Lord, that means yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That knowest that I love thee. Peter, you have not really answered the question. You know, if, if I were, you know, a teacher, if I was still a teacher, I used to be a teacher in the school, and then I ask a question, Do you love him more than these? If you're going to answer in the affirmative, yes, Lord, you know, I love you more than these. But you know, he didn't finish the sentence, yes, I love thee. He says unto him, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. You see, you know, the way I have come, I fed you. You told the other people, I go up fishing. And then, I didn't find you where I felt you will be. You are in the wrong place. And then I came to you. I said, children, do you have any need? Instead of scourging you, instead of chastising you, instead of rebuking you, I said, do you have any meat? You said, no. Then I told you, throw your net to that side uh, and you will catch. And you threw your net there and you caught. And you even started counting, you know. And I said, come and dine. I prepared everything for you. That's the love I have shown. That's the love I have demonstrated. And I want you to show that same love to other people. So I'm asking you, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And the Lord is still asking us, is the perfect love that you showed? Is the productive, practical love that he showed that he wants us to show, not a theoretical love, not a doctrinal love, not a chapter and verse love. It's a love that is practical. Look at verse 16. He says to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He removed the word more than these. You see how the Lord accommodated his limitation. And he said, Lovest thou me? He says unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my sheep. Have you noticed here? He didn't say, That's what you said before. You said you'll die with me. You said you'll die for me. You said you love me and see what happened. Jesus mentioned nothing of that. That's love. That's love. He allowed him to save his face. He allowed him to uh, kind of forget about his guilt. He had forgiven him and was just calling him now to come and serve. The same thing we should do to people. Our coming to Saturday workers meeting, our coming to the Monday Bible study, our coming to the Sunday service, our coming to the Tuesday's leadership development, our coming on Thursday. It is to take the lesson and learn the lesson and put in our lives and things must improve. Things will improve. And so in verse 17, he says unto him, the third time, the third time, the third time. How many times uh, did Peter deny Christ? Three times. And Jesus, without mentioning anything about that, but he wanted to remind him, but he wasn't going to remind him directly. And so he asked him now, the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved. Uh -huh. Peter was getting it now. You will get it. You will understand. You see, when you hear the word of God, if you just hear the word of God and, you know, it doesn't touch you, doesn't pinch you, doesn't prick you, you hear the word of God and it doesn't bring any emotion in your heart, any emotion in your mind, any emotion in your brain. You hear the word of God and it doesn't remind you of what you have done, how you've done the work of God and how you have not given everything. And then you just hear the word of God and you see the point one, point two, point three, and you see the structure and say, that is good. If that's all it does, it has not done its effective work in your life. It says Peter 
was great because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know that things are different now. And you know that since you appeared uh, on the shore here, and you said, throw your neck there, my fellow disciples said, that is Jesus, that is the Lord. And when I had that and saw what you've done, and saw the approach you have taken, while, like, while you said, come dine with us, and I was eating that food, I, I was thinking, look at Jesus, look at my shepherd, look at my Savior, oh Lord, make me like yourself. Things have changed. And he said, thou knowest all things, thou knowest knowest that I love thee and Jesus says unto him everybody tell me out aloud feed my sheep if you love the Lord you will feed his sheep you'll care for his sheep and you will be thinking this is the sheep of the Lord this is the lamb of the Lord and your action your attitude to the sheep your attitude to the lamb will reflect the respect you have and the love you have for the Lord because this is not just a sheep this is not just a lamb this belongs to the Lord and because it belongs to the Lord I'm going to take care of this I'm doing it for my Lord we're looking at the shepherd's perfect love for the sheep three things we're looking at number one the perfect love of our Savior the perfect love of our Savior Point number two, the pure love among the saints. The pure love among the saints. Point number three, our persevering love for the shepherd. Everything we do is because of our love for the shepherd. Yes, we belong to the church. Yes, we're in deeper life. Yes, we're singing to the congregation. Yes, we're ushering. Yes, we're doing security. Yes, we're doing whatever. But everything we're doing, we're doing it unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Why it not for the Lord? Because he loved us and because he saved us will not be here. Why it not for the Lord? Because he gave himself for us without any restriction, without any restraint, and without any limitation. Why it not for the Lord? We will not be doing what we're doing. Therefore, our love, that's why we we'll never get tired. Although the people will expect, are they not? Those deep and live people, they're very busy. And every time they are, you, know, you go to them, to their houses, you don't be tired. They've gone to distribute track, or they have gone to knock on somebody's door or they have gone to prayer meeting or they have done for choir practice or they have gone for you know whatever their weekend they're fasting and praying and there's something always happening and thank god there's something always happening and you'll not be tired in jesus name you know why you know why because we're doing it for the lord we're not doing it for them we're not doing it for man even though we're visiting the sinner we're not doing it just for the sinner we're doing it to the lord even though we're visiting the members we're not just doing it for the members we're visiting and we're helping them because of the lord our persevering love for the shepherd tell me point number one there the perfect love of our Savior. We have to start with him because it is because of his love. That's why we're now reproducing that love. And that is why we're going out of our ways to love his people. We're looking at First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 9. First John chapter 4, reading from verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. That's his love. That's his love. We believe that love. It says in verse 10, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, he loved us, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, there is no fear in love. It's epitomized in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
he was faced by the Pharisees and they said they will crucify him. And even Caiaphas said, you don't do anything at all. It's expedient that one man, this man in particular, will die. He didn't fear Caiaphas because there's no fear in love. Look at the mother once again. Uh, the child is just you know, about walking now. And the child, uh, they're going to the market. And uh, the mother was holding the hand of the child. All of a sudden, the child uh, wants to be independent uh, and removed his hand from the hand of the mother and uh, wants to cross the road. As he's uh, crossing the road, the mother sees uh, a vehicle coming. What did the mother do? The mother stood back and said, Oh, my child is gone. Did the mother do that? What did the mother do? You know, she's not afraid of the vehicle coming because love is a stronger emotion than fear. Love will cancel that fear and she rushes on. And of course, if the driver did not see that little child, the driver will see that mother. And, uh, you know, therefore carries a child. And everybody, you know, the people who are not uh, the uh, parents of the child, they're saying they put their hands on there. Oh, something is going to happen. But the mother did not even hear that. Because, you know, there is no fear in love. When you love, you don't fear. You, you remember, you remember when you were about to get married. I can, I can picture you now. And they said uh, you, it's dangerous to go out at night. And if you, you know, leave your place and you go to that other place when you are coming back and the whole place is dark and the street light is not there but you know you have appointment to see your you know your dear your honey your whatever you have even started honeymoon you have not gotten married yet and then you are going there and while you are going there uh, you know it's getting dark you don't remember what they said it's difficult it's dangerous to go out at night and then you are there you're not looking at your time at your wristwatch and telling her finish 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 shopping time you know it's getting dark and then after you said everything you wanted to say and all that and she too as you're going will come out and accompany you and then you say you can go back now let me just uh, just a step more while when we get to that um, uh, light uh, pole or whatever i'll go back and then she got there you can go back now okay let me go you remember and then eventually she goes back and then before you get back home it's late and you didn't remember they said it's dangerous to go out at night you know why love cancels fear and when you love the lord as the lord himself has loved us he forgot all about the pain of persecution and the pain of a betrayal and the pain of the of the crucifixion and he faced the crucifixion he knew that he would cry out aloud my god my god why have you forsaken me but he went on on until he said it is finished that's why we too were serving the lord there is no fear in love i said there is no fear in love when you love the lord and you love the sheep like he loved the sheep all fear will go away from your heart in jesus name it's not that you are fighting the fear it's not that you are struggling with the fear it is just that you are so consumed with the work you are called to do that all the fear is gone away from you and the lord will protect you and the lord will preserve your life and your love which is perfect love following after that of the lord will not be in vain in jesus name in first john chapter 4 verse 18 there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment and he that feareth is not made perfect in love we love him verse 19 because he first loved us we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, tell me, love his brother 
also. That is the love of Jesus Christ, and it is perfect love. We are coming to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, we're looking at verse 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's his love. That's his love. Christ died for the ungodly. Look up here for a moment. How could Christ die for the ungodly? Because he didn't see them the way they were. That's love. He didn't see, you, you know, let me come back to the mother. The mother is taking care of this child. And if the mother is a forward-looking mother, if uh, the mother is uh, projecting a mother, if the mother is uh, somebody that has a goal and has, you know, has already preached and said, this child is going to become such and such, so the mother is not looking at what the child is now. This child is going to become a president. Give me some amen there. This child is going to become a doctor. Can I have your amen? This child is going to become somebody that will minister to thousands of life later. It is because of that dream. It is because of that glory that is looking at this child now and is taking care of the child and the Lord is looking at you like that. Not what you are today, but what you will be in the future. You are going to be somebody. Even though you are nothing like in non entity before, but thank God you are going to be somebody. If you believe that, show that you believe you are going to be somebody. Look at this, look at this. They were ungodly, and yet it's just like, you know, let me remind you of Peter. Look at Peter, and look at him wavering, and look at him denying Christ. And then Peter said, I go a fishing. Lord Jesus, why are you running after the man? Look at the man. He said, I was not going to die. He denied you. And look at the man. He said, he never knew you. Look at the man now. He's got other people. And he said, they go a fishing. He said, I'm not looking at him the way he is now. I'm looking at him the way he will be on the day of Pentecost. And the way he will be in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Silver and gold have I none. What I have I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Everybody tell me, rise up and walk. And it happened. It happened. And so when you're looking at the people, that's how you love people. He, he loved us when we were ungodly. He loved us when we were unstable. Because he knows we're not going to remain like that. That's why he showed that up. Look at verse 7 there. In verse 7, that is Romans chapter 5 verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet but adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. Love without limitation. Love without restriction. Love without any kind of restraint. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the perfect love and that's the love that has transformed us and changed us completely. Come to First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. We're reading from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. It says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. How do you love a person like that, a blasphemer? Oh, because you know he's going to become a believer. He's going to become an ambassador. He's going to become a preacher. He's going to become a miracle worker. And he's going to become the one that opens the door to the Gentiles. And therefore, you're not looking at what he is now. That's why he loved him. And he said, I was a persecutor. But he's going to become a preacher. I was an injurious person. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and, uh, and love. You see, that is it, love, which is in Christ Jesus. 
And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so you can say the love of Christ for Saul, Saul of Tarsus, because of what he knew Saul will become. And because the Lord knows what will become, that's why he's showing that love and it is perfect love. And it is the love that saves, it's the love that sanctifies. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, I mean him from verse 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That grace comes into our lives and the grace does not leave us where we were, where it found us. The Lord transforms us and change and changes us. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself. That's the love. Who gave himself. That's the love. He didn't reserve anything. I'll keep my dignity. You know, there are some people, they're too conscious of their dignity. Dignity. They're too conscious of their honor. They're too conscious of their position. They're too conscious of, uh, you know, their personality. And it says, yes, I'm serving God, but I'll, I don't want you to forget who I am. I don't want you to forget, you know, my honor and my glory and all that. You know, that's not a total love. But when you love people, you forget, you forget. It's like, you know, somebody comes to visit you and there is uh, just a little child has been born. And uh, this person comes, he's looking at his dress and you're handing over the child to him. And he said, uh, draw him back. And then you say, what are you drawing back? I'm giving you my child so that you can hold my baby and, you know, and show love to my baby. He said, well, I understand, but I'm sorry. Um, you know, the, the child, look at the way she is and look at the clothes and look at my dress. When I finish here, I'm going out to have an appointment. He's thinking of the appointment. He's not thinking you know, of the little child. But, you know, the mother will not do that. Doesn't matter how good the dress is and doesn't matter matter about the father too will carry that baby even if the dress is a spoil that's not the problem is the love for the child the same thing the same thing when you think about jesus christ the shepherd and the lord and the love we are shown and now you are caring for the sheep we are caring for the little ones it's not about your dignity it's not about uh, you know what you have what you don't have and your position in society it is about out the love we have. That's why he gave himself, not reserving his dignity or his honor or his personality or whatever it is. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me what follows there. Zealous of good works. He, he saves us, he sanctifies us, and that's what he does so that he can reveal and demonstrate his love unto us. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it was the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing you know, but that it should be holy and without blemish that's the love he'll do it in every one of our lives Deuteronomy chapter 30 Deuteronomy chapter 30 what does he do so that we can reproduce, replicate the love that the shepherd has? How is it that Jesus Christ as Savior, Jesus Christ as shepherd manifested that love? And what can we do to manifest such love? We're coming to how do, what experience do we have so we can manifest that love? Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. He said he will do it, so he will do it. I said he will do it. And he says, and he will circumcise the heart of thy seed. Why? 
What's the purpose? Why will you circumcise us to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live? How do you love somebody with all your heart, with all your soul? Uh, what it means is that you so love that you are not thinking of any other thing. You know, sometimes, uh, let's say you are getting married, let me come back to marriage again. Uh, and this is all the money you have. And then your wife to be, is, she's not even in the house yet. She needs something. And then you forget, you forget all the regulations and all the laws. Don't give her something. Don't. But she is uh, almost uh, dying and she needs this. You forget that you will need money any other time. You forget that you are still going to pay house rent. You forget that you are still going to buy this or that. You even forget that you are going to need money to go to work tomorrow. Everything you've got, you just put on her because she must live. Your wife will not die. Your husband will not die. That is, all you have, all your thought, all your mind, and all your heart, you lavish upon her because of your love. Love does not calculate. Love is not stingy. Love is not holding back. Love is not saying, I need to calculate now because I'll need that tomorrow. I'll need that next week. I'll need that the other time. Love does not calculate. You love with all your heart. And when you are circumcised in heart, and then you see now this is your savior, this is your shepherd, and this is your substitute. This is the one that has gone to prepare heaven for you. There's no calculation. There's no calculation everything you've got now that your heart is circumcised you love him with all your heart all your soul and all your mind no reservation that's how we're going to be loving the Lord I said that's how you are going to love the Lord point number two now the pure love among the saints the pure love among the saints I'm coming to first Peter chapter one first Peter chapter one and we're reading from verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, unpretending love. There's no hypocrisy. You just do it. You take care of the sheep. You take care of the lambs. You take care of the people. And it is not that, you know, they are watching me. I'm going to write a report. I'm going to answer questions. And if I don't do this, uh, how will I have something to write? Not at all. On faint love, on pretending love, on hypocritical love of the bread and see that she love one another. Tell me. With a pure heart, how? Tell me, tell me. Fervently, uh, come back to the mother again. Uh, have you seen uh, the mother that is holding her baby and she's controlling uh, her emotions, she's controlling her laughter, she's controlling her joy, she's controlling her excitement. You know, people are there and I don't want to laugh in the public, I don't want to show that I'm happy. No! fervently and when you love when you love those uh, saints of God and those children of God you are happy you show it you are excited you show it you are lifted up you show it and you know that this is the highest point and the highest moment in your life when you can take care of the saints of God of the people of God you show it and you do it fervently nobody has to teach you to do that nobody has to prod you to do that you just do it because this is what brings joy in your life look at verse 23 being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever that word will abide in your heart will live in your heart we're looking at Romans chapter 13 Romans chapter 13 we're reading from verse 9 Romans chapter 13 Verse 9, this is the kind of uh, love uh, that we are talking about. It says uh, in verse 9, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not uh, covet. If there be any other commandment uh, 
it is uh, briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, everybody, one, two, three, go. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at verse 10. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Look up for a moment. There are times, uh, you know, sometimes we don't know how these uh, things uh, happen. That a mad woman by the side of the road got pregnant. And this uh, mad woman delivers a baby and this baby although the woman is mad and you can tell look at her hair you can tell look at her dressing you can tell and look at the way she is by the side of the road you can tell but she has a baby and this baby no matter what is happening this mad woman will find food for that baby am i right and if it's going to rain she the woman is mad and she's looking that rain is going to fall she'll be preparing something to cover the baby look at that love will not do any evil although the mad woman when it comes to somebody comes and she wants to you know do evil she might uh, use something to strike somebody because she thinks they're going to hurt her but this baby she'll never use that rod on that baby she'll never use any instrument to hurt that baby because the love even supersedes the madness. The love even suspends the madness that love will not do evil unto anyone. The same thing when the love of God is in us. The same thing when we're children of God and the love of God is in us. We might not be too educated. We might be sometimes even eccentric. We might do some things that they say, why are you doing that? Why are you acting like that? But all the same, when it comes to taking care of the sheep and of the lamb, we love. I said we love. And then you go out of your way and you will not do any evil to the saints of God. Love does no evil to the people of God. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11, and that knowing that the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation. That's final salvation. Nearer than when we believe. The night is first page. And that day is Saturn. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk how? Are you going to walk? Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, nor in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, nor in strife or envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all of love without hatred. It's all of love without pretense. It's all of love without hypocrisy. It's all of love without limitation. And it says, put on Christ. That's all we need to do. You put on Christ as if you're, you're dressed in Christ. And so your own uh, kind of littleness of faith or your own kind of limitation is not seen. Only Christ is seen. And the love of Christ is seen. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. Amen. Amen. Look at chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're looking at verse 9. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 9. It says, Let love be without dissimulation. Let love have its transparency. Let love have its purity. Let love have its flowing of freshness that is not, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to control myself so I can love them. Really, I'm not happy with them. You're happy with them. You're happy with the children of God. And then you serve. It says your love is without pretense, without hypocrisy, without, uh, you know, lip service, without, um, you know, just showing it because even though you don't feel like, it says let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. You will be kind. I will be kind. I said, I will be kind. 
and, and you know kindness is not theoretical you have to you know he, he, has, he needs food kindness will give the food he needs dressing cloth uh, kindness will give the clothing he needs uh, help uh, somehow and kindness will give that it says be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another in honor tell me tell me out aloud uh, let, let's come back to the family again uh, you know uh, there's not too, there's not much money in the house and we need to buy food daddy needs to eat mommy needs to eat the other children have to eat and now the little child that just came into the world and everybody is singing and everybody is happy that little child also has to eat and how the mother has prepared the food there is available. Who did they consider forced to have food? The mother or the baby? The baby. In honor preferring one another. We give preference to the people we love. We give care to the people we love. We give attention to the people we love. You know, the mother has not slept well during the day. She's been running up and down taking care of the baby. And now the baby is asleep. And uh, the mother is trying to catch a little sleep. And now the baby suddenly, at an, un at an unannounced time, wakes up and begins to cry. And the mother, or well, the mother say, cry the way you want. I'm going to sleep. I can't hear my people. What will she do? In honor, preferring one another, I need rest. She needs rest. Her rest, number one. She needs some comfort. I need some comfort. Her comfort, number one. When you love people, you see their need, even though you have the need yourself. The love makes you to prefer other people. I want to be happy. He wants to be happy himself first. I want to have joy. She wants to have joy herself first. I need care, and she needs care. The care of that person first. That's the love that Jesus Christ has demonstrated. And that is the love. He wants uh, the pure love among the saints. It will happen. And look at verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving to hospitality. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Now you understand from all the illustrations I've given, it's out of love and it's natural. It flows. It goes on to the people we love. Bless them that uh, persecute you. Bless and curse not. Bless and curse not. Look up here for a moment. Are you tired of my illustrations? The mother as you know is taking care of this baby and uh, the baby is still breastfeeding but now the baby has started uh, you know growing a uh, teeth and the uh, baby just is excited that you know there's something in my mouth that can grip something and bite something and now the mother is taking care of the baby and breastfeeding the baby and the baby thought it's a good experiment to experiment you know what i have and to see whether my teeth will you know grab this one and then she beat the mother and then what does the mother say the mother said you'll never have a breast milk anymore in your life does the mother say that never love will forget about that love will excuse will excuse that baby when people do things they shouldn't do and they step on your toes if there is no love okay if you see me visiting you again cut off my legs we're not going to cut off your leg you'll go back there again I said you'll go back there again. Because you see, when there is love, we don't mind what they have done. We don't mind what they have said. And we don't mind the way they have treated us because the persecute will love them. 
the abusers will love them. They don't know what they are doing. If they knew, they would not have been doing what they were doing. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. I'll pay him back. No, love does not do that. I'll strike him back. Love does not do that. I'll retaliate. I'll revenge. Love does not do that. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide honest things in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap a coals of fire on his head. I don't know whether you've had this uh, before, but uh, you know, this uh, husband and wife, uh, the wife became born again, and the wife, a real child of God. But the husband said, What kind of new religion is, new religion is this? Born again, born again. I don't want it in this house. And the you know, wife kept on serving the Lord. And eventually, the, uh, you know, of course, the wife, the husband, what were called uh, violence in the home, violence in the family. The, the man, well, you know, sometimes a beater and do whatever. But the woman will go to a corner and be praying, Lord, change him. Lord, convert him. Lord, save him. And, uh, you know, the man appeared to be going worse and worse. But eventually, the man had a uh, eyes problem. And the eye problem, they wanted to, you know, he became blind and they couldn't do it. It wasn't like a cacti, they would just remove something. Or like a glaucoma, they removed something. Their eyes were totally bad. But the nerves inside were still alive. And there is only one thing they could do. They could remove that bad eye, at least one, and then find a good eye and put it uh, there. And uh, the wife had uh, two good eyes, but, um, you know, she didn't uh, allow the doctors to tell the man that she you know she was surrendering her own eye. Now the man could not see anything, could not see anybody. She went to the hospital and the doctor said that um, they will perform the operation. He should be prayerful, you know, if it will succeed. And then behind the two, okay, the wife, the wife went to the theater and they removed one good eye. She still had one left. And uh, they did the eye um, transplant. And eventually, they, they covered it up. Uh, the other one could not see anything. And after some weeks, she was now okay. And it was uh, now to be discharged from the hospital. Now he could see. He looked around. He said, this is beautiful. The world is good. The world is beautiful. I can see that. I can see that. And the doctors did not tell him who had the eye that they put there. And uh, eventually, the wife now came because the man was to go from the hospital back to the house. And uh, for the first time, she he looked at the wife and said, What's wrong with you? What happened to your eye? That, um, you know, because now you could see that the woman does not have the other eye. It's just the socket there. And then the doctor said, We had to remove that eye to give it to you. And the man was broken. With all the treatment I've given you, and with all the oppression I laid upon you, and with all the evils I said, born again, born again, not in this house, you donated your eye for me, the enmity ended that day. I said the enmity ended that day. It's not a parable, it's a story. It's something that really happened. That is love. That is love. And when we're able to do that, the people who have offended us, the people who are thinking, I'll never do this, I'll never give them that, when we turn around and we give what is precious to us, I believe that all the enmity will be over. I can't see an excited church. 
Look at verse 20, verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, tell me out aloud. Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. God will give you the grace. God will give me the grace. Say it for yourself. God will give me the grace. He'll give us the grace in Jesus' name. Ephesians, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 2. It says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Don't uh, walk about having hatred, pregnant of hatred, pregnant of animosity, and pregnant of, uh, you know, retaliation. But you walk in love. As you move about, there will be love in the heart and love on your eyes and love in your steps and love in your springs and love the way you are moving. The only thing you can think about is what can I do to show love? What can I do to demonstrate love? And walk in love as Christ also who has loved us and has given himself for us an offering an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling favor. We're looking at verse 25. Verse 25 it says, husbands love your wives. Husbands love your wives. You cannot be in the house and you're not talking together. You cannot be in the house and you're keeping malice. You cannot be in the house and then it's like uh, two strangers are living under the same roof. Husbands love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Look at verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as, tell me, as their own bodies you'll not hurt yourself you'll not poison yourself you'll not uh, pour acid on yourself you'll not defame or the de um, kind of disfigure yourself the same thing the same thing for your wife you will take care of that wife so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself look at verse 33 nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love on the line that word so it means you love but you so love that even your children will say oh mommy loves daddy so much and daddy loves mommy so much they will tell and your neighbors can tell to you everybody can tell because nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband it will happen. Yeah. We're looking at uh, First Peter, First Peter chapter three. In First Peter chapter three, and I'm reading from verse eight. First Peter chapter three, where there's love. Look at the characteristics and look at what will happen. In First Peter chapter three, and we're reading from verse eight. Here it tells us in verse eight. Finally, be ye all of one mind. We're thinking in the same direction. We're going in the same direction. We're saying the same thing. We're not contradicting each other. We're not opposing each other. We're not, uh, you know, taking different paths. When there's love, it says, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not drawing dream evil for evil. You know, in the, in the family, uh, there are times uh, we can mistakenly say something, mistakenly do something, and somebody steps on your toes. You don't say, uh-huh, whether he meant it or not, I'm going to do it back to him. That's, that's not love. That's not love. Retaliation is not love. Revenge is not love. Hatred is not love. Paying them back in their own coin, that's not love. Throwing stones back to them when they throw a pebble to us, that's not love. It says not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called that you shall inherit a blessing. You'll inherit your blessing. Your blessing nobody will take away from you. Okay, my blessing nobody will take from me. 
Love will preserve our blessing in Jesus' name. In First Corinthians chapter 13, First Corinthians chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1, where you see the word charity, it actually means love. It says in First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? And I have not love, charity, I am become a sounding brass, and the tinkling symbol and though i have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though i have all faith so that i could remove mountains and have no charity i am nothing and though i bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though i give my body to the bond and have not charity have not love it profited me nothing Charity suffereth longer and is kind. Charity suffereth longer. Because of their immaturity, you suffer long. And because of their carelessness, you suffer long. Maybe because of their carnality, you suffer long. Maybe because of their backsliding, you suffer long. And yet you are kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Charity does not boast. Charity does not say, I know who I am. I know what I have. Why it not for deeper life? Why it not for this Christianity? You'll not even come near my doorstep. Why it not for the fact that I'm a worker? You'll not even call me by name because this is who I am. Charity does not envy. Charity does not vaunt itself. Charity does not... Uh, puff us up he does not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked charity is not easily provoked you know a little thing will make some people angry a little mistake that another person has done will make some people flare up a little mistake that other people or something that other people have done, well, they'll be so provoked, they'll be talking and talking and talking and talking, and they'll be talking bad, bad things. It will not continue like that. Charity will not behave itself unseemly. Charity will not seek her own. That's my place. That's my position. That's my right. How dare you sit there? Didn't he tell you that's where I always sit? How dare you come near there? You don't know your place. You don't know my place. Charity seeketh not her own. Charity is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Charity thinketh no evil. You see, there are some people, if you've offended them, maybe they cannot fight, or maybe they are fighting inside their heart, but they don't want to show it. They say, if something bad will happen to him, then he will know God is defending me. That's not love. That's not love. Nothing bad will happen to us. Yeah. Nothing bad will happen to you. Yeah. When you offend somebody and he's saying, you know, if something bad will happen, that's getting near witchcraft. That's getting near witchcraft. And then when you say that person is pregnant and then she didn't look at me the right way and she didn't greet me when she ought to greet me, okay, uh, God, teach her a lesson. When she loses that pregnancy, ah, that's witchcraft. They will not lose pregnancy in our church. I said they will not lose pregnancy in our church. We cancel all those things because charity thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, Be beareth all things, and believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Amen. Amen. Point number three now a persevering love for the shepherd. As we carry out our ministry, and as we show the love to the people of God, we're showing that love because of the Savior, because of our substitute, because of what he has done. It is the love of Christ that constrains us. It's the love of Christ that pushes us. It's the love of Christ that activates us. It tells us in Second Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. 
For the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ is the one that drives us, that motivates us, that compels us. Because that love is planted in our heart. And because that love is engineering us, is the one that is moving us on, it says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we just judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves when we understand that we are to love the lord because he loved us and the love of christ constrains us compels us and the love of christ the one is the driving force within us we know we're not to labor unto ourselves you know those who are living unto themselves I cannot go out today. I'm a little bit tired. If he is as tired as that, he'll still go to market. He'll still go to the place of work. He'll still go and cook in the kitchen. But then, because of this little kind of discomfort, I cannot go to the workers' meeting now. It will change. You're welcome. And then all the programs we have, at least, you know, um, I think maybe I'm older than that person in front there. Am I older than anybody over there? And yet I still keep coming. If I keep coming, you will keep coming. The same strength I have, you will have. The same motivation I have, you will have. And the same excitement I have, you are going to have in Jesus' name. Uh, you know what it says? It says, henceforth, we do not live unto ourselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Uh, that's the kind of love he wants us to have. He tells us uh, in Matthew chapter 10. Look at what he expects. Look at what he expects in Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, you understand that? Of course, that Jesus Christ gave his life. Jesus Christ shed his blood. Jesus Christ has purchased salvation for you. Jesus Christ has gone to prepare paradise heaven for you. And your father cannot do that. Even if he wanted to, he cannot go and give you a place in heaven. He cannot give you salvation. And Jesus has given you something eternally greater than what your father or your mother can give you. And the natural thing is to love him more than you love your father, more than you love your mother. And then it says, he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You understand that, of course. Your son, your daughter cannot give you mansions in heaven cannot give you inheritance in heaven but Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a mansion for you and if he has gone to prepare something eternally greater than your son that your daughter can give you of course you will love him more than your son you love him more than your daughter I was waiting for an amen and even if you have not got a daughter yet the daughter is coming if you have not got the son yet, the son is coming. And it says Jesus Christ is the one to give you the son. is the one to give you the daughter. Now to love the gift more than the giver, that will not be all right. That will not be all right. Is the one that gave you the wife, you still love him more than your wife. Is the one that gave you the husband, you love him more than your husband. I can't hear the amen again. And all the gifts he gives us, we love those gifts, we appreciate those gifts, but we are going to love him more than the gifts we have received. But look at some people, look at some people in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Think about yourself. How is your love today? Is it getting brighter, getting hotter, getting more fierce, and getting uh, more exciting? Or is it that, you know, it's getting cold now, it's going down now, and then you are lukewarm now? I pray that that love will come back even today in Jesus' name. 
and, but it says in verse 13 but he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved I will endure to the end my love will endure to the end my endurance will endure to the end and my zeal will endure to the end I thought you'll say it for yourself Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast led thy first love. Think about it now. Thou hast led thy first love. Look at yourself, examine yourself. Thou hast led thy first love. The excitement you used to have, the joy you used to have. When you first came in, I'm a worker now. When you first came in, I'm a pastor now. When you first came in, I'm a teacher of it. I taught the sad scripture last Sunday. When you first came in, the joy, the preparation, and the searching of the scriptures, and the prayer, everything you put into it, but now they say you are going to lead again inside the scripture next uh, Sunday and uh, okay uh, I've been doing it now, the excitement is gone, the joy is gone and the happiness is gone, it has become routine but the Lord is saying you've left your first love, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of his place except thou repent. He will not remove your candlestick. You will turn around and you will love him more than ever before in Jesus name. Psalm 119 Psalm 119 I'm reading from verse 47. Psalm 119 look at verse 47. I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. Your commandments I love them. I'll delight myself in them. Look at verse 48 my hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments which I have loved I will meditate in thy statutes you know you, you meditate on the word of God because your love is statutes verse 97 in verse 97 oh how I love thy law it is my meditation all the day how I love thy law it is my meditation all the day verse 113 I hate vain thoughts but thy law do I love? Verse 127. In verse 127, therefore, I love thy commandments above gold. Above gold, above naira, above currency, above money. I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. And then in verse 20, 128, therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. I hate every false way. Verse 159, in verse 159, consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness, thy word is true from beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Look at uh, verse 163. I hate and abhor lying, but thy love do I love. Verse 165, it says, um, Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Verse 167, my soul has kept thy testimonies, and I love them how? exceedingly. I can't deal without the word. I can't deal without the commandments of God. I can't deal without my Bible. I and my Bible will travel together. I love that Bible. I said I love that Bible. Anybody, do you have any Bible there? Where is your Bible? I love the Bible. I said I love the Bible. I will always read the Bible. I will meditate on the Bible. I will walk according to the word of the Bible. My Bible will be the closest possession to me. I love the word of God. Where are you? I said, where are you? 
rise up and tell the Lord, I love that word, I love that word, I love that word. Nothing, nothing, nothing will take that word away from me. I love the word. I love the Lord and I love the word of the Lord. He has loved me perfectly and I am going to reciprocate. I'm going to show that love. I'm going to love the Lord. Now show him by the way you pray and tell the Lord how much you love him, how much you love the word of God.